So I'm a psychologist and I have been at Siteman for 15 years now, just um, working both with people with cancer but also their family members. And let me just see by a show of hands here, how many people here are a caregiver for someone? Yeah, just about everybody, right? I mean, I, there's this quote by um, Rosalind Carter who says there are four kinds of people in the world. There are those who've been caregivers, those who need caregivers, those who are caregivers, and those who will be caregivers, right? So it's a universal thing. We'll all either have been there, or have needed it, will be there. So it's a universal thing. Um, there was an interesting statistic, it's a little bit dated now, it's from 2012, that said there were 13.7 million cancer survivors in 2012. That's a lot of cancer survivors, good news, right? But think how many caregivers are behind that 13.7 million cancer survivors, right? So probably at least one, if not more, so it's a large group of people who are involved in caregiving, and that's just for cancer. There are other, lots of other illnesses too. So I wanna talk about just briefly some of the challenges of caregiving, and then we're gonna get into some discussion as a group, right? We're gonna use our collective wisdom. So a couple of things about caregiving. There's some societal changes that have made caregiving more of a challenge. Um, there's some medical changes that have made caregiving more of a challenge. One is that more and more treatment happens on, in the outpatient setting, right? So more and more people are dealing with treatment effects at home. So caregivers have a more active role. Um, so that's one change. Um, people are discharged from the hospital earlier, so maybe sicker, maybe not quite totally recovered. So that's, that's also affecting the home. In terms of societal changes, families are smaller, right? The average family size has been decreasing, so that means less potential caregivers. Um, families are more geographically spread out, so maybe less local potential caregivers. And more and more, it used to be, if you look historically, women tended to be the caregivers, um, and they still are slightly more, but those women tend to be working. So caregivers are more likely to be working, even if they're male or female caregivers, they're more likely to be trying to work and provide care. There's not the, the easy person at home who can just be a caregiver like there used to be so much. So lots of stresses in our system. I was at a, um, we had an ethicist, the surgeon who's a palliative care specialist was here at the hospital at um, Barnes this week doing the Lucas lecture and he was talking about challenges for caregiving and one of the things they were talking about is that, you know, um, too many people are dying in the hospital who want to die at home. And the thing I kept saying is like, but, you know, how are these caregivers supposed to do this? They're working, there are fewer of them to share the work. I mean, we've got to grapple with that sometime as a society, that we're putting more and more stress on fewer numbers of people to provide more and more complicated care. And somehow that math is a bit of a challenge. Um, Let's see, so let's, uh, the, I wanted to mention also about um, distress screening. I'm, so I'm a psychologist, as I said, so distress screening is an interesting movement in oncology. Um, the American College of Surgeons Commission on Cancer accredits cancer centers around the country. Um, and most cancer centers want that accreditation, makes them look good and helps with their uh, um, status. And one of the new mandates coming in in January 2015 is that accredited cancer centers have to screen for distress. Um, so you may have seen that where you get your care if you've been asked to rate your distress. So that's uh, something that everybody's going to be doing by January 2015. And I've talked places around the country and people are really stressing about how to make that a part of their practice. But interestingly enough, fewer people have screened caregivers. And one of the things you see in those few instances where people have screened caregivers is that caregivers are more distressed than the person with the disease. Interesting um, to, to look at that. Now, why might that be? You have any ideas about why caregivers might be more distressed? Mm -hmm.
It's a lot of responsibility on their shoulders, yeah. Okay. Anything else? Some of it is probably as a caregiver, you don't know. There's not a lot of information to work from as the, the patient is being talked to by the doctor and they understand the condition. The caregiver doesn't always get instruction on how. Yeah. Great idea. So the roadmap. I mean, a patient might be told, okay, you're going to have this surgery, then you're going to have this chemotherapy. Nobody hands the caregiver a roadmap and say, okay, this is what you need to do. It's much more uncharted. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I think the caregiver is going to say, oh, so far from the patient and the caregiver itself. Yes. So maybe a... Yeah. So they've got a, a dual agenda. And I have to say that um, the caregiver's perspective, I mean, I, since I work with both, I think I, I, I appreciate that both are hard. But to watch someone you love suffer and not be able to fix it, that is hard. That is a true challenge to be in that role of the helplessness of not being able to um, to help the person you love or fix what's going on with them. So lots of challenges for care. Did you want to say something? Did you have something else? I think that you don't know how the other person reacts. Mm -hmm. What are his concerns? But you are, you are not so thinking of yourself, so, you know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, another thing really, oh, yeah. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, and also your own mental health. You have to make sure that you are on solid ground. And that's a lot yeah. of that's a burden too. You need to be yeah. physically and mentally, emotionally, spiritually, all mm -hmm. on solid ground. And you know, the little bits of data looking at caregivers, again, there's not a whole lot, says that um, caregivers actually tend to neglect their own health a lot of times, prioritize their loved one's health so they don't necessarily get their annual medical visits or they don't. I'll put my problem off until we get through this. And yeah, so um, I think also, I don't know if you all feel like this is true, but um, a lot of times, not always, but everybody gets focused on the person with the diagnosis. You know, the medical team certainly is, but also sometimes in the social s network too, everybody gets focused on the person with the diagnosis. And so the person, the caregiver whose lives have also been disrupted isn't getting quite the same extent of support. And that, not that they would ask for it even. They would, they would say, of course, let's focus here, but they just aren't incidentally getting that support. So a lot of challenges for caregiving. Um, a couple of other things I want to throw out there is that people are more or less comfortable with the caregiving role, right? I mean, some people just aren't comfortable with it. Maybe they don't like being around sick people. I mean, really, maybe they don't like being in medical settings. My dad was a perfect example. He hated being in medical settings. So whenever my mom needed to go in the hospital, I would go. I, this is in North Carolina because my dad would all of a sudden have many errands he needed to do. He just could not sit in the hospital, couldn't stand it. And not that that's good or bad, it's just who he was. He just didn't like that setting. I've also talked with people who, they don't like needles. They don't like see, how do you go to an infusion center if you don't like needles? I mean, you know, it's just, so some people are just not good at that. You know, so that's, that's one given. The other thing is just when you have an experience of illness of some sort. So the question of whose experience is it? Whose story is this? Whose experience? I, I have seen a number of couples where there is a conflict about how much are we going to talk about this and not talk about this, right? So what if one person's a talker and the other person's not a talker? And what if the talker wants to tell everybody because that's what they do, that's how they cope. But the person who's not a talker wants privacy. I don't want, and that can be a real challenge 
my, um, my husband had a heart attack maybe, maybe 10 years ago, eight years ago, something like that. Um, and I'm a talker. That's what I do. I talk. And he is not a talker. And I was talking in a way that made him uncomfortable. People, he was getting very upset because people would be coming up to him like, oh, I heard about your heart attack. So what we finally reached an agreement is that I would tell people he didn't know. I would go to Walgreens and talk to the cashier. My husband had a heart attack. You know, this is so distressing. I thought, okay, the cashier does not know who my husband is. We have different last names. She'll never figure it out. So, you know, you got to figure out some way. If we have different styles, how are we going to do this, right? And compromise is hard about a lot of things. Cap on the toothpaste, cap off the toothpaste. I mean, how do you, you can't have things, some things both ways. So trying to figure out how you share this experience if you have very different styles of coping about it. Um, okay, so I'm gonna, enough talking for me. Why don't we, let's get up here a list. Um, trying to be sensitive to the time. Let's first of all, if you can tell me about challenges of caregiving. So I've laid out some broad things. What are some very specific things that are hard about caregiving? Tell me what's hard about it. Let's get a list of some challenges. Oh, yes. So rest. And you know, if you look at the literature on caregiving, caregivers are very tired. <laughs> they are very tire tired. Um, they don't get enough rest themselves. And also, if, you're, if your loved one, I, I once heard the head of the sleep center at WashU talk, and he said, a sleep problem is the only disorder that affects two people. Whoever is also sleeping, near that person with that person has a sleep problem, if somebody has a sleep problem. Uh, I would also say, uh, working with a woman who has young children, anybody who has young children, if they, kids have a sleep problem, they have a sleep problem too, even if they're not in the same bed, the same room. But sleep problems tend to be shared problems. Okay, what other challenges? Yeah, so we'll talk about, so the, care, the person with cancer or with whatever illness is maybe not the only person you're caring for. So multiple caregiving roles. And you know, they, um, there was at one point they were calling that the sandwich generation, the people who get, uh, have parents to take care of and children to take care of that get kind of crunched in the middle between both those responsibilities. Yeah. What else? Schedule. Schedule. Especially if you're working and commuting long distances, but trying to keep people there with the patients and making sure they want your way, especially if you have young children, like you said. Yeah. So don't you think sometimes you need like an Excel spreadsheet or something? I mean, trying to, I see, I see people with cancer are pulling out this calendar and just trying to you know, color code, it just, schedules are complicated. Now, we at the hospital contribute a lot to that. Sometimes we aren't helping you with that. It would be nice if we would say, one day, let's try to, or rather than multiple trips, but we don't always do that, right? Yeah. Guilt. Yeah, that's a good one too, or uh, maybe not a good one. You know what I mean? It's a, it's a great, it's, but guilt on lots of levels. I mean, there's that idea, can I ever do enough, right? Can I ever do enough here for work? Can I ever do enough at home? Can I ever do enough? Yeah, a lot of guilt about I'm dropping the ball all over the place. Yeah. Uh -huh. What's that? Patience, yeah. Yeah, patients, all over the place. I mean, just even, so I work at the hospital, just the waiting, all the waiting. You know, I was waiting for my, uh, my chai tea that I decided I had to have this morning because it was cold. And I almost gave them a fit thinking I wasn't gonna show up here today. <laughs> but I was not being very patient. I was hopping on one foot like, where's that chai tea? Um, what else? This probably tags off with guilt and helplessness. Yes, helplessness. Yeah. No matter what you do, makes, can make them comfortable, so to speak. 
Yeah. Yes, helpless, that's a, that's a good label. And you know, there's a lot about cancer that makes people feel helpless. There's a lot of uncertainty, right? I mean, so on either side of it, as the patient or the caregiver, nobody tells you, you know, we're gonna do this and we're gonna get this outcome. There's a lot of uncertainty. There's a lot of waiting. There's a lot of wondering. That can be a challenge. And then I think also for caregivers, sometimes if you're the person at least directly, they, they, there's something you can do. You have this test coming, go get this treatment, and as the caregiver, um, you're just stuck in helpless mode. There's not as much you can be active about. So I think that helplessness is hard. <coughs> Lack of what? Lack of control. Yes. You know, we all know that we are not in control, but yet, when you get to the debate, you know, I have a lot of conversations with people about this lack of control, because cancer's all about that, right? And some people are better at that, and some people aren't. You know, I mean, some people go with the flow better than others. Some people are planners, and they want to know. And cancer can drive you nuts if you're somebody who likes to plan, know, be on top of things, because it's all about uncertainty. That, um, and so that lack of control. So, you know, dispositionally, you may be better at that, or you may be really hard, at, really terrible at that. Yeah. Uh huh. Relationship and communication. So communication. Yeah, that's a good one. Um, and communication with. Um, there's communication within the family, there's communication with the medical team, there's communication with insurers, lots of layers of communication. You know, one interesting thing too, um, so if you look at the data, younger caregivers are, struggle more than older caregivers. So younger adults have more distress associated with caregiving. And I think that some of that is, well, why do you think that is? And then I'll, I'll add if there's, I need to add. Why, why do you think younger adults struggle more with caregiving? Like a generational thing, where mm -hmm. independence is taught. Mm -hmm. you know, but uh, in the older generation, you took care of people, we didn't question. Less practice. Yeah, so younger adults have less practice at it. This is more like, what the heck do I do? Yeah. Did you have something to add? Yeah. Yes. Yes. And that's that's more frightening. Yeah, I think when you haven't had practice at it. How's your dad? So it's um, it interferes more with what you have going on. Younger people want to go, go, go. Yeah. Yeah. So being tied to the house or the or the bedside is harder. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Because we feel like we've got to be doing something. Mm -hmm. And if you are younger and trying to build a career, trying to start a family, maybe trying to find a partner, that it's hard to do those things when you have a lot of caregiving burden. And um, I think as you were saying too, maybe um, since we're more spread out, the long distance caregiving is really hard. I'm the daughter from St. Louis. I'm sure they hate to see me in North Carolina when I, in Fayetteville, my mom's little town. When I come back, I'm the, you know, the dreaded daughter from St. Louis or something. <laughs> any, um, any? We got a good list of challenges here. Uh huh. I think several of these lead to frustration and resentment. Frustration, yeah. And You know, um, I'm going to take that one step further. Sometimes we don't even like the person we're trying to take care of. Maybe that doesn't apply to anybody here, but I find that to be particularly painful. If you 
are trying to take care of somebody, feel like you should take care of somebody, and you don't even like them. You know, that, bless your heart if you're trying to do that, but that is a really tough thing to do. And maybe this is somebody who was uh, mean to you. Maybe a spouse, maybe a parent, maybe a sibling who was mean to you in some way, and you're trying to care for them and have such mixed feelings about this person. That's, that's really painful. So let's spend some time talking about how do we manage all these challenges? Okay, so we, we want to talk a little bit about, um, this topic is about stress management as a caregiver. So how do we cope? What are some ideas about how to cope as a caregiver? So we can talk about, especially if there's anything that you've tried that's helped you, and then we can also talk about theoretical ideas. So what, tell me what's helped. What, what do you think will help caregivers? Prayer, okay, prayer. I'm gonna see if I can make two columns here. I didn't really save room too well, but so we don't erase a so prayer, okay? So um, faith can be a big source of comfort for people. Uh-huh. And some people also find comfort in others praying for them, to know that others are praying for them. So even it's not necessarily just have to be your own prayer. Yeah. Yeah. What else? Yeah, uh, I'm going to call that respite, but yeah, so getting a break. And I was just yesterday meeting with somebody, a woman whose husband has um, advanced cancer, and she works two days a week, part-time, I think like maybe four hours, five hours at a retail store. And she feels so guilty about it, but she loves it. I mean, she loves getting out of the house. She loves doing something else. She loves her job. Um, but she has such guilt about that. And we were talking about, um, you know, what's the downside of going to that job? What is the downside? And she said her husband's okay with it. He seems to be safe on his own. It's just her sister gives her grief about that. Like, wow, why aren't you staying home with your husband? What'd you say? Yeah, really, really. Why didn't she show up? And, yeah. But so it was just guilt kind of that was coming from how other people were reacting to it. But I think that respite, many people, I didn't make this up. I wish I could say I made this up. But they talk about caregiving is a marathon versus a sprint. So you need to think about if this is going to be a marathon, how do I pace myself, right? It's a sprint. You just give it all you got. But if it's going to be a marathon, I have to think about how to pace myself so I can hang in there. So I think that respite is the, very important in terms of how to pace yourself. Yeah, is getting some space. What else? Caring Bridge? So a couple things. So one of the, the things you were talking about the most was this, having some place where you have an outlet for expression, um, and I, whether it's online or not. So uh, yes. Yeah, so some place where you can just get this stuff that's rolling around inside out, and whether that's online or on paper or through art or whatever. Um, and you mentioned Caring Bridge. I want to go back to that. So that's something, how many people know about Caring Bridge? Okay. So it's a resource where you can um, set up a page for your loved one with cancer and you can post updates there so that you don't have to be the one conveying information to everybody. You can post the updates on the web page and you can give that link to loved ones. They can check in and you, they can also leave messages. So rather than you have an answer to the phone all the time, you know, they can leave messages, you can post messages. So it just kind of makes that a, like a one-stop shopping. I don't have to tell 10 people what's going on. I can post it. 
they can find it themselves. It's free resource. Um, many people use it and like it. And now the blog that you use, is it on Caring Bridge? Yeah, you can use it. There's a journal. Yeah. You can write your, you know, and you can update your journal as many times as you want. Like I said, it's a great time manager. It comes from family of nine. Yeah. 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 And you can limit who access it. Really access it. That's mm -hmm. right. So it's not like going on Facebook and just trying to see who you can Yeah. You can limit it and it's, and it's free. Yeah. yeah. So it's a, it's a great resource. I think there might be another one like that. I can't come up with the name of it. You know, I can't remember the name of it. Um, anyway. Yeah, I can't remember, but great tool. Other times, uh, people who maybe aren't as comfortable with the electronic thing might designate one person in the family, maybe not the person carrying the major caregiving load, but somebody else who's the information officer. <laughs> you know, who will be the, everybody will call that person, and that's their job, you know, for the family. Is there the person who will give out information or whatever? I mean, some people will do that um, to do. Yes. Yeah. And I know some people also, this is maybe the very low tech way to just use the answering machine. Just, we're not going to pick up the phone. Let people leave their messages there and we can listen to them whenever. And even if you're comfortable with it, not everybody is, but putting an update on the answering machine, you know, so that you don't have to tell the same update. So there's low tech and high tech ways to do this, but using your resources for sharing information. Okay, what else? Good support group. A support group, okay. All right, so, um, so peer support. Getting a chance to meet people who are in your same circumstances is very important. And in the St. Louis area, there's only one place I know of that has support groups just for caregivers, and that's Cancer Support Community. They have caregiver support groups. So specifically so it's just caregivers in there and um, that's a wonderful resource I also what support group is also talking about the friends you have because ah. the neighborhood we live in mm -hmm. a bunch of the women have already said hey do you need to go we'll take we'll bring you home yeah. that to help us out yeah and uh, of course your family mm -hmm. so support it's a great point so i I, I took off and ran with the support group idea, but use your support system and um, let people help you. You know, sometimes that can be a hard um, barrier to overcome, especially if you've tended to be fairly independent. And I've had many a conversation where I said, you know, maybe this is the life lesson you're supposed to learn right now is how to receive help, how to let people help you. It can be a very hard thing to do if you're not comfortable with it. But maybe cancer caregiving is one of those things where it takes a village and letting people help is very important. The chemo that provides those is really great. It's all wide open. And it's about the support that you can tell every time you go to chemo or go on to the like social events. Everybody has another story. A lot of people worry, a lot of people die. I really mm -hmm. you know, go to a chemo and everybody talks. There's some places that have chemo over in a private room and they close it. So using the people there who are obviously going through the same thing, kind of a built-in support. Yeah. Now, interesting thing too. So, what if you go to that infusion center and, as the caregiver, you want to talk with people, but your loved one doesn't want to talk with people. Interesting challenge too. How do you manage that in the setting? But is it possible yeah, to? <laughs> yeah, yeah. I might circulate around the room a little bit, or if there's a little snack area, or whatever. I mean, so you don't necessarily, if you need different things, maybe you, you find a way to meet your different needs. I think you're pointing out <clears throat> that the caregiver really has to take care of themselves. Mm -hmm. and they Mm -hmm. And I think that's sort of overreaching in the whole caregiver um, syndrome. Yeah. 
So that taking care of yourself, very important. And I'm gonna broaden that out to, in general, that's an important thing, especially if this, go back to this idea that this is a marathon versus a sprint. You have to take care of yourself. Are you are going to run out of gas, you're going to burn out, you're gonna do something. So that self-care can look like many different things. There's the microcosm of it, like, okay, I'm at the infusion center and I can't sit in this chair the whole time. I, I need to move around. Great, take care of yourself. But also the broader thing, how do you take care of yourself? And let's spend a moment talking about that. So what might self-care look like? Exercise? Yeah. So exercise, uh-huh. And you had something? Well, I'm going to piggyback on the idea of self-care and also the idea of that respite idea you used as the example of the woman who worked the night shift. Mm-hmm. And so whether your Mm-hmm. But not to let that outside noise, if you will, people are going to who are going to will comment. I can't believe she's going to work this. You know that you, that you can ignore that mm-hmm. and and understand that nobody is in your shoes mm-hmm. with your person. Yeah. So. so Mm-hmm. So you have to be comfortable, and in essence, be comfortable with willing and be willing to take that backlash even if it's from family and say, mm-hmm. you know what, you just don't understand. Yeah. Until you walk through these shoes, you won't understand. Mm-hmm. But for my sanity, I have to do this. Mm-hmm. They're fine with it. We talk about it, and be comfortable with being able to communicate among you know between you and, and the patient is very important to be able mm-hmm. to communicate with the idea that I'm not abandoning you, you're going to be okay or bring a family member in to set, that's what I did, I mean I had to work, mm-hmm. work, but my my wife's mother came or ladies from our church would come and sit with her mm-hmm. during the difficult days if I had to be at work, but it, it allowed me that escape route mm-hmm. to maintain my sanity and yes. to replenish the necessary resources because when I went to work, while I thought about it, it there was other you know, things going through, but it allowed me to be in a, I guess, in a non-reality of what the situation was. It helped me to escape, to, mm-hmm. to think about other things, because I had to process what I was doing at work, and mm-hmm. hands on, and being out. It, you know, I had, thankfully, I was able to be outside in nature. My job causes me to go you know, out to streams and springs, so I was able to see parks and things. So, I was able to get back out into nature and mm-hmm. forget. I, I, that sounds horrible, but I was able to forget about what the reality of the process or the, the path that I was walking on. But exactly, it helped me to distract. But in that, mm-hmm. it helped me to replenish yeah. the, the energy that I needed to go through what we were going through. So, but you have to be comfortable in doing that. And you know, some people may have questions about that, mm-hmm. but you have to be willing to stand up mm-hmm. and say, "No, this is who I am." Yeah, so some of what I've heard you all. So part of it, there's so many things that came out of this. So um, prioritizing your own needs too. You know, and again, as caregivers, we tend to put ourselves last. And not to say that you always put yourself first, but you've got to put somewhere on the priority list that self-care. And whatever that looks like for you, that self-care. Again, if you're going to be able to fulfill this caregiver role, you have got to prioritize that self-care. 
some of what we were talking about too is just the way that can look different from person to person. And so figuring out what you need, what is restorative for you. Uh -huh. The other side of that too is you can't feel sorry for yourself all the time either. Mm -hmm. I mean, it goes both ways. And yeah. But I mean, it's important what you said too. But you can't live your life worried about what somebody else thinks about it. Right. Yeah, so. But, but, I, so the, but the other side of that, what she was saying, is that sometimes that makes you feel worse because you use your harder on yourself than anybody else. Yeah. I think that's too the importance of having the network and support group. Because I know for me, I had a good friend that's a psychologist as well. So. Mm -hmm. Even though it wasn't in an official capacity, I was able to bounce things off of him of what I was going through. Mm -hmm. now, maybe not everybody has that ability, but finding somebody, even though they they may not actually have walked through the process themselves, but they can understand what a human being goes through when they see their spouse. Mm -hmm. through that. So, mm -hmm. Uh huh. I kind of remember back when we were the years we had kids. Uh, where they, they were telling you, you can't let this child change your life. You gotta, you mm -hmm. kind of look at the people and say, what do you mean this child ain't gonna change our life? <laughs> yeah. We're not gonna be able to pick up and go like we used to and mm -hmm. stuff like that. This is the same thing, you know, this is gonna change your life. You know, your life's not gonna be able to pick up and go. And you can't worry about people been saying, well, I can't believe they're going to work, you know? Mm -hmm. well, what do you do, just say, work, forget about insurance, forget about income, yeah. I and mean, you got to do it. And that's where, you know, you try to get your support group and together mm -hmm. to help you out. You know, I come from a very large family, and, you know, they're all right there, and uh, more than happy to stay with them if they need to, or if mm -hmm. they need with women, too, because you still do have to function and go to work, bring the check home, mm -hmm. but also make sure that your wife's getting yeah. So those competing responsibilities, and sometimes, again, with insurance, you got to work and you got to bring in income to, for the family. There's this expression that you hear a lot in cancer if you don't got it, you don't get it. I would say the same is true for caregiving. You haven't been there, you don't get it. And you, maybe that ex phrase doesn't, don't, don't got it, you don't get it, doesn't work quite as well. But I think the same, the same sentiment works. Everybody's got So it sounds like your values. So like if, values. if if family is one of your values, is you know that's. It's a matter of will, your will or faith. Mm -hmm. And if you call one to care for that person, you have to make it as you will to care for that person or not that person, regardless of what you pay mm -hmm. your emotion. Mm -hmm. so that, 
that they think that God will be, keep us, keep on going. If you lose faith, then you lose faith in everything. If you lose faith in mm -hmm. yourself, and you lose hope, and that's uh, why people keep commit suicide. Mm -hmm. So some people, for their value, they, they don't even, it's not a choice about whether I'm going to do caregiving. I, family is important to me, this is my family, and this is what I do in service to that value, or this is what I believe God would want me to do, and so that value is important. Mm -hmm. Now, I, a couple of things I want to, related to what we were saying. Um, so the self-care, I want to go back to, we didn't say, uh, earlier we were talking about rest. So self-care can be very practical and basic, like I need to eat decent food. I need to get enough rest. Maybe I need to exercise. I need to get some time to myself. Whatever that self-care looks like. But you know, sometimes when you, if you're spending a lot of time in the hospital with someone who's sick, you may be eating crappy hospital food. I don't, you know, but just try to get some good food, get some rest, whatever you need to do to prioritize that, taking care of yourself physically. I also want to mention this idea that I like a lot. Um, I hope it works for you. So if you think about your coping reserves as like a bank account, right? So you have this big a pot of coping reserve. And if you're making a lot of withdrawals on that account, you need to figure out some way to replenish it or you are going to bust the account, right? So how do you restore yourself? How do you replenish your coping reserves? And again, maybe you're in a stretch of your life where you're not drawing on that account a lot. So it doesn't need so much attention. But if you're gonna be making withdrawals, you need to figure out how to Re replenish it and that may be as we've talked today that may mean different things for different people but how do I replenish my coping reserves and doing that in a very purposeful way and prioritizing it um, distraction I think is a wonderful thing you know having a moment to just forget your worries and however you do that if it's mindless TV if it's getting out in nature if it's I don't watching a movie, reading a book, if it's working puzzles, whatever you do that just gives you a mental break from it. I think distraction is a wonderful thing. I don't think it's a bad thing to, to do that. So I, I think that can be a good thing. The thick skin, um, I wish that you didn't need that, but you may if you have people who haven't been in your shoes who criticize and say, well, why are you doing that? Or why are you doing this? Or you should be doing this. We just have to have a little thick skin and just cling to what we know works for us, right? And just trying to make our, our way through this challenge as best we can. There's a hundred different ways to be a caregiver. I don't know, 200 different ways. There's not one w recipe that works for everybody. So you just have to find what works for you about how to be a caregiver. What about, yeah, any other, any other thoughts, any other? I just about to say, with the communication with the person that you care about is caring. Mm -hmm. it, sometimes you don't realize that that person uh, can give you great information uh, about whatever their really encounter with their real needs. And sometimes, I don't mean as a, as a husband, I assume I needed to be there for this, be there for that, not leave the house. And, and in communicating, You know, um, piggybacking on that, I think that it's hard for us to totally appreciate the person with cancer's perspective, and it's hard for them to appreciate ours. As you're saying, we're each having a different experience of this, and each experience is hard in different ways. So as much as we can try to inform each other about what the challenges are, how we're coping with this, I think that's, that's ideal. Now you may have the issue where some people are not talkers and some people are, and so maybe you have to compromise somewhere in the middle. Okay, so we won't talk about this every day. Maybe we'll talk about it once a week or something, but 
you know, trying to figure out a way that we can um, share with each other what's going on. Uh huh. doesn't appreciate oh that's a tough one isn't it that never happens does it <laughs> yeah. um, you know hopefully uh, oh, did you have something to add you just have to do what you think is right you can't worry about what the patient thinks you're on the right track I think yeah I just wanted to say that a lot of the things that you have listed are for the cancer patient as well yeah so yeah. Yeah. And so I think, you know, back to values, hopefully you do this for something that feeds your own values. Yeah. And so maybe, hopefully it's not just for what we get back because sometimes we don't get that back. Hopefully we, we pay it forward or something. Thank you all so much. I appreciate all your contributions. You made this so much more interesting and relevant because of what you shared. I appreciate that. Thanks.